Now, oh. <laughs> okay. Good morning. What a joy to be here today. I, I'm uh, going to fight the temptation to do a lot of visiting, but I can, I can tell you that I'm thrilled with what I'm hearing that God is doing with you. I, um, I have to first uh, apologize to Pastor Kenwin because uh, I, I think I was the fly in the ointment for him uh, having the outside services because I kept hearing that it was going to rain and I'd call him and tell him it's going to rain. <laughs> and and uh, uh, I, I think I just caused a lot of, um, of heartache to him and I apologize, Brother Kimley, for doing that. Uh, uh, what I can say is your new pastor has more faith than your old pastor does. Because <laughs> it hasn't rained at all. Now watch it be a gully washer tonight. <laughs> but um, to be here, uh, we've been gone now about a year or maybe a little more. And um, when we left, I, I shared with you a couple of times at least that we would uh, be away. And to be away mean that we would not uh, interfere with the, the congregation of pastors. And um, uh, now that it's been a year, um, I, I'm going to interfere. <laughs> and, uh, we uh, love uh, Pastor Oliver and Pastor Ann, and we have, uh, we do, and we have not, uh, we've not called them, talked to them. We love Eric and Sharon. Eric's called me a couple of times, and we've chatted, but uh, we love Jerry and, and Sammy. We've not called, and... Uh, uh, Katie and I talked a couple of times, and uh, uh, but just a couple of times, because I wanted uh, the new pastor to uh, have full freedom. He he is uh, he's a young man with a lot of energy, and I want to I want to share this with you about him. I look at myself when uh, I was young in the ministry, and um, he is far advanced at his stage in the ministry that I was when I was at his stage. And I believe there are great things ahead for him. Um, he has a good heart. He, he loves God and he loves people. And uh, that's easy to support. Now that doesn't mean he's going to make every decision the way you want it. Um, there'll be times that he'll have revivals under the pavilion instead of in here. I mean, uh, <laughs> but he is a he is he is a godly young man, and Andres is a special, special lady. And what a wonderful help me you are to, uh, to Kenwin. And uh, very soon, less than a month, there's going to be three little hunts <laughs> that are going to be here. And uh, uh, what beautiful children they have. I, I think that um, that today God has laid some things on my heart to, to say to you. Um, some of it may sound a little hard. Uh, I don't mean for it to be hard. I mean for it to be truth. 
And you know, sometimes truth is hard to swallow if, if it affects your life. And the Word of God is a two-edged sword. And by that I mean it, it cuts. It will cut away the things that are not spiritually healthy for you. And it will cut to plant those good seeds in your life that will help you make it home to heaven. I love the revival. We've had awesome speakers. All, all uh, three of them. And tonight, I think, is going to be the, the greatest. But the end game of us is not to have a great revival. It really is to please God and make it home. Because if we miss heaven, we've missed, we've missed eternity. Think about it. And so today, I'm going to talk with you on how to apply the blood of Jesus. And as we talk about it, we, we have to understand that the blood of Jesus is not like your blood and my blood. The, the blood of Jesus is without the fallen nature. And it's through the blood that we have salvation. When you mention the term the cross, you're not talking about what we hang around our neck or, or have as an ornament in the church. We're talking about the sacrifice that Jesus paid for our sins. And the price that he paid was his precious blood. A lot of the Old Testament scriptures foreshadow the giving of the blood of Jesus to us. I want to share with you just as an introduction that when Jesus was born and lived, Seven times he sprinkled his blood. Now I want you to think about this. He shed his blood in Gethsemane. The stress on him, and there's a medical term for it, the capillaries in his body burst and his sweat mingled with the blood, and he spilled his blood. He sprinkled his blood. The high priest took Jesus and abused him, and they struck him across the face with rods, and it, it brought out the blood. The third way is they pulled out his beard. And the blood came out. The fourth way was he was handed to Pontius Pilate and being given to Pontius Pilate, he gave him over to the lictors with the cat of nine tails and he was beaten. He was put over a stock. His back was stretched. And one lictor would start at the nape of the neck and come down. The other lictor would start at the heels and come up. They were professionals in that they could pull the flesh and sinew out of the body of Jesus without disemboweling him, without killing him. They nailed him to the cross. When they nailed him to the cross, they pierced 
his hands and his feet. They put a crown of thorns on his head and they <coughs> slammed it down and it brought forth blood. When he was dead, they thrust a spear into his side. Blood and water came out of his side. Sevenfold sprinkling. I don't know if the Lord meant for it to be the, the seven of completeness or perfection, but there were seven ways that Jesus shed his blood. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. It is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. There's some amazing prophecies in the Old Testament. One of them is that Jesus would shed his blood. Isaiah 53 and 12 says, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. I've, I've really studied for this message for probably a month. And I began to ask God some questions that I've had all my ministry. And one of them is this. I've often wondered, where is your soul? I mean, you know where your brain is. You know that uh, your heart physiologically is here. But where's your soul? Listen to what happened with Jesus. It says he poured out his soul unto death. Now, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I'm not quite there yet, but I'll, I'll challenge you for you to study it, but I'm almost there to believe that your soul is in the blood. He poured out his soul unto death. Now how did he pour out his soul unto death? By his blood. And Jesus, when he did that, became an offering for the whole human race. His soul took the place of my soul. My soul, when this blood goes out, without Christ, I'm dead. But with the blood of Christ, I'm still alive. You're still alive. Because his blood is life. I'll tell you, I just sense the power of the Holy Spirit right now. Everything Jesus said was truth. And a, a lot of times, we don't know how to make it real in our life. I'm, I'm going to say some things, as I said, that may sound hard, but it's truth. Unless some of you change your life, 
You're wonderful church members. But you're going to miss heaven. Because being a good church member don't put you in heaven. The only thing that will get you to heaven is the blood of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Nothing else. And here is the dilemma. The scripture says broad is the way that leads to destruction. And narrow is the way that leads to life. I'm so concerned that in today's American culture, we have ruined church. Our, our concept of church has brought us to the place that we are so fickle that every little thing makes us so aggravated and mad. And I see so many churches since I've left. I've been invited to so many churches. I've First six months, I didn't take any appointments. I was tired. <laughs> and then pastors called me, and I'd go, and I'd, I'd preach for them. And I'm shocked at how many angry Christians there are. And I see in the Scripture that God says, what I want you to do is to acknowledge that my blood is shed for your salvation. And he wants us to apply it. It's, it's not that we acknowledge that he gave his blood. It's that we receive it and that we apply it to our life. I can tell you this. When you apply the blood of Jesus to your life, you can never be offended again. Never, ever, ever. Because you die. Now I know, I know you received his blood and abundant life and all that. Okay. But when you receive the blood of Jesus, it kills you and makes Jesus alive inside you and Jesus could not be offended ever I sit in my living room at home I, I got a, a, a nice little 1400 square foot home that uh, we paid very little for it the Lord gave gave me wisdom, not Vicky, but <laughs> the Lord gave me wisdom <laughs> to, to buy it when there was such a crash. And we, we did. I wanted one with eight foot ceilings so it could cool it good. Not cost us a whole lot of money. I wanted one with a big backyard but I didn't get that. What I got was a tree. And I can sit in my recliner and I can see my tree. <laughs> and I'll sit there, Vicky will call me, what you doing? I said, I'm, I'm looking at my tree. <laughs> and I, I just, I sit there and, and I enjoy looking at the tree, but I started thinking deep. You know, when you've pastored for 47 years and now all of a sudden you, you don't have that, you start thinking deep about yourself. 
And I begin to think, Lord, am I okay? Am I all right? You said, you said if you put your hands to the plow and look back, you're not fit. Lord, I, I, I took the plow all those years. Am I okay? And then I got to thinking about the folks I've pastored. And I thought, oh God, are they okay? D did I tell them the truth enough? Was I, was I so afraid to hurt their feelings that I didn't tell them everything? And I, 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 I'll just stop there and not tell you what God told me. But I, I can tell you this. The end is coming soon. It's coming. And when it comes, are you Okay. Is everything all right? What have you got that you've hidden in your heart that displeases Jesus, but you justify it by that's just how I am? How, how are you? I mean, you may be great in the eyes of the church, but how are you in the eyes of God? I'm going to take you to a, a verse of scripture, if I can find it. I've got enough pages here that I, I, wait a minute, I'm lost. Let me, let me take you to Revelation 12 and 11. It says, and they overcame him. They. That's the believers in Christ. Now listen. They overcame him. Who is that? Satan. There is a, a clear conflict between you and Satan. How did they overcome him? Now watch this. By the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Now watch this. That's not all of them. And they did not love their lives to the death. Now that's commitment. And can I tell you, that's the only kind of Christian that scares the devil. When you get to the place that you just don't care. If I live, Paul said, if I, if I live, it's Christ. If I die, it's gain. And there was nothing Satan could do with Paul. As a matter of fact, when Paul got ready to die, he said, I'm not ready to die. He said, the time of my departure is at hand. He just counted as, I'm going to another world. It's a departure. And he also said, and there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And he also said, it's laid up for all those who love his appearing. Devil, I don't care what you, what you do to me. I don't care what you take away. I don't, I don't care what you do. You will not move me from loving Jesus. Amen. Totally. And that scares the devil. 
They wanted to do the will of God. Now, I'm going to move because I got something here I, I really want to get to. Um, I want you to open your Bibles. I want you to open them to 1 John, 1 John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1. You know the light's not real good here to read when you're old. <laughs> Pastor, you need to get some light in here. <laughs> look, look at 1 John chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon with our eyes, 